Daniela Hart at Design Miami, and I'm going to host a tour of what has become as the world's most influential design fair, illuminating some of the best objects in this fair. And I want to thank Design Miami, thank Christie's, and thank World Red Eye for producing this video. So join me on this tour. Hi, <laughs> welcome to Design Miami. And uh, we are having our annual tour where I'm going to host some exquisite speakers. And think about it, each one of them is, has chosen only one object. So this tent is filled with thousands of objects. They only chose one. And they're gonna to explain to us why they chose this one and what is so special about this object. Because the more you look at design, the more beautiful your world becomes, the more understanding design, the more sophisticated your taste becomes. So join me on this tour and thanks for being here. I'm Vincent van Dozen. I'm a Belgian architect and we're in front of an incredible, beautiful bookcase designed by Charlotte Perriand. Why did you choose that? Well, first of all, because I'm a big fan of Charlotte's work. Um, you know that I'm a modernist in heart and soul. And if you look at this piece, I mean, I think you will recognize also a little of the style of my work. It has a kind of an architectural expression um, in its simplicity, but yet it's very complex. Um, we are in front of Nuage, which is the French for cloud. And... Um, nuage. Nuage, yes. That's and the that's the name of it. And Charlotte Perriand was um, a designer architect that worked alongside Le Corbusier for many, many years and Jean Prouvé in the early 2030s. And then uh, before war, um, she went to Japan for a couple of years. And basically also, I mean, what you could see at a certain time, she started to work in a more simpler way. I mean, in the beginning, it was more with steel and more industrial lookalike furniture pieces that she created, where this one, she entered wood and aluminum. Um, and initially she designed it uh, around the 50s, uh, more for, um, let's say, more industrial use or not in elegant, sophisticated, domestic ways. I wanted to ask you because Charlotte Perriand did this for Steph Simon Gallery. Exactly, yeah. So she did, first she did the, uh, the bookcases for university housing. And, also, and by the yeah. way, she got the inspiration for the bookcases in Japan. Exactly. In a place called the Imperial Villa of Katsura. Katsura. Exactly. Where I've been uh, this summer for the third time. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been there, yes. It's the most beautiful place on earth to it's me. It's amazing. It's a magical place. It's a magical place, uh, the architecture, the nature. Also, again, the simplicity. I mean, a lot of woods and uh, it's very geographical and geometrical designs. Uh, which you can reflect also on these particular pieces. Um, but what I also like about this particular piece is that, of course, as you said, she used to work more for uh, dormitories and universities, um, like more, you know, uh, kind of like more industrial kind of like pieces. And then through the collaboration with that French gallery in the mid 50s, like 55, 56, for Steph Simon, who had his um, sh shop, his gallery in Boulevard Saint Germain in Paris. He actually appealed on Charlotte to curate some of his shows and also to work together along other artists like Jean Prouvé, uh, like Serge Mouille, like Pierre Jouve. And uh, she created and she was commissioned to create this particular uh, bookcase where she actually elevated her initial designs into a more sophisticated way, applicating the wood in it. And also, I mean, kind of, kind of like um, giving a different uh, identification to the piece because you have wall mounted pieces like this one it looks like you know a very dynamic organic floating sculptural uh, bookcase which is made out of wood and then in combination with this kind of folded aluminium uh, niches which can enhance particular objects itself and I mean you can go endlessly with the systems and then she has the freestanding bookcases as well as the wall mounted ones but this particular wall mounted one is a super strong piece I mean it reminds me even of a Donald Judd piece, to be honest. I mean, I've never said it has something very minimal, avant-garde minimal. And you know, if you see it from the distance, 
you barely see it, it's a furniture piece because you could barely think it's a beautiful sculpture that floats and hangs against the walls, in, in my opinion. You know, Vincent, you're doing some of the most magical interiors in the world. And I can definitely see this in new interiors. I but have, I have another question. Do you know anybody who wouldn't want to live with us? Well, I've been very, very, very um, honored by a client of mine in New York uh, where I designed a penthouse in Bond Street. And um, we have particularly this kind of nuage in the back of, um, of, a de of a writing desk in the living room. And it's, you know, it's one of a kind and I'm very happy and very proud to have one of her pieces in one of my work. It's not one of these pieces you live and you never want to part from. And Vincent, thank you very much. My pleasure, Daniela. Now, you are here for a specific uh, project. Can you say something about that? Well, I'm basically here um, to present a collection of uh, 18 pieces made out of natural stone for a Mexican company, which is called Arca. Um, they're showing tomorrow my collection, which is called Gravitas in Wynwood in their showroom. And all of you, you of course, you're invited to come and, and see these pieces. You know, the name Gravitas already says itself. It's made of natural stone, so it's heavy weighted, it's rooted, and it's very poetic at the same time. You know, I mean, uh, we love the pureness of design, but we love the soul and the heart that, that sits behind it. I mean, also, Charlotte Perriand, she dedicated a lot um, of her work to the art of living. Her work was very human-centric in all senses, and I think my work is also very human-centric as well, and I think it's there where I also have an incredible affinity and admiration for the work of Charlotte Perriand. My name is Gareth Neal, presenting three pieces at Design Miami. I've got Echo, Grace, and Twisted Pear. This is Gareth Neal. And he's going to talk about his exquisite work, which is made in sand, and it's been printed. It's been 3D printed. So how, how, how are you? I'm very good, thanks. Yeah, no, it's really exciting to have three major pieces here. Yeah. yeah so can you talk about this? Because this is like, I fell in love with this one. Well, it's the first time I've got the, with digital work, you have the opportunity to do iterations, which is, one of the most amazing things about the technology that you use. So to just make tiny incremental changes and put in so much detail into an object is what designing on a computer can enable you to do. And the 3D printing... Can you explain like to everybody how the 3D printer is working? Because you know, usually 3D printer is working on plastic material. This one works on sand. So it throws sand. Yeah, so it's printed in a ginormous bed of sand over 24 hours and it's buried in sand and then at the end of the process the object's actually excavated, like archaeologically excavated out of this giant sort of eight foot bed of sand and then ve at that point they're very, very delicate and then when air comes to them they start hardening up and then slowly we take them out with well, a forklift truck, actually, because we build beds as well, but, uh, yeah. So, everything about your work is very neoclassical. You yeah. have this neoclassical yeah. form of the vessel. Yeah. The vessel is your mantra. Yeah, it has become that way, yeah. Well, I grew, my dad was an archaeologist, and I grew up on excavations, digging up pottery, a Roman pottery, um, and, uh, and my dad was an illustrator of uh, archaeological finds. So the house was constantly full of pots and ceramics. And so this was kind of my upbringing where I was surrounded by these kind of forms that have now inspired my kind of career, I suppose. So it's all neoclassical and you started your career doing something with Zahadid. I did, yeah. Something not like that, but you can see the same language yeah she commissioned me to do a um, some tableware for her and we did a water carafe or it was based on a water carafe as aha did and yeah i had the privilege to work with her and collaborate with her on uh two uh pieces yeah before she sadly passed so you know if you want to know something about 3d printing and like digital you should ask gareth because he's always like on top of the technology how did you find these people in Germany? They well, they, that well, they actually found me. 
because they'd seen my other digital work and they knew that I was a craftsman that liked exploring digital technologies. And uh, they were doing very boring, dull stuff with their machine and not really knowing how to, what to do with their process. So they were looking to collaborate with an artist and, and yeah, so the uh, relationship was born. My name is Megan Hughes and I'm the owner of uh, Megan H Gallery and the piece that you're looking at is Hervé Ballet, it's the sofa, pièce unique that was made in 1990. You selected this piece sofa piece from everything else. Indeed, indeed. Why? I did because I think that this piece is what I will consider a showstopper and the reason why is I think that it it embodies all of the technique and the vocabulary of Hervé Ballet that is all synthesized in this form. I think that when you look at it from the side, from the front, from the back especially, you have this kind of a sculptural element that really transcends the form and the functionality of these objects. And I think that that's what really blow me over by his work. So what is it made of? It's, it's very simple as most of his work. It's used uh, plywood in most cases that are usually have another layer added on it. But it's, it's really one of the uh, ideas. That and this book? This book? You published this book? Indeed, I did. Uh, two years ago when we had the first retrospective of Hervé Ballet, which I'm, you've seen, which you wrote on it. There's a beautiful little uh, uh, statement from you as well. And um, it synthesized, you know, all of the body of work until last year and that I we did. And why do you tend to upholster the Hervé uh, Ballet pieces in green? Like so, yes, um, that's a very good question. Uh, ultimately, because uh, some of the, the, the pieces were originally in green, and I thought that uh, I wanted to keep this, the, the originality and actually, you know, a poster in them as well in green. I'm Tony Ingral. I'm an architect and designer based out of New York. I'm Rogan Gregory. I am the artist, sculptor, designer for this work here. I want to know from you, how do you make it? Well, I start with the inspiration, which typically comes from um, the natural world. Um, a lot of uh, plants and, um, and a lot of deep sea creatures that, I, that, I, um, that could be alien life forms um, because they're in, um, in the deep ocean. And um, they don't have, just like I would imagine a uh, uh, alien from another world, um, they don't have to deal with gravity. So when you have a piece hanging from the ceiling, gravity is less important. Like if you have a piece that's on the earth, you have to have legs supporting it. If you're hanging something overhead, a sculpture in particular, you can have it hanging from one point. So it seems as though it's floating. You took that off. So, um, but also because we are, we do have to do with gravity on Earth. Okay. This, the internal structure. You do it by yourself? I have an assistant. Okay. Um, but the internal structure is steel. Steel? Yeah. And then? And then the shell is gypsum. It's like a, a, a plaster. And you make it by yourself? And you yeah. polish it? And yeah. Yeah. How long does it take to make this? Um, it depends on how big scale the piece is. Because I make small like and big. One. This one, from start to finish, is like two months, probably. Tony, yes. why do you like the, his work for your interiors? Well, what, do, what do these pieces do to your interiors? What I love about Bruno's work is that it transcends time. It's time. It, it relates to nature in a big way, which he explained, but it also goes forward. Thank you. Like, this, you've never seen a light picture that looks like this. So I know that in 25 years, when I walk into one of my clients' rooms, that I'm always going to be excited to see that piece. 
And if you follow Rodin's trajectory, the work has evolved beautifully. Like there's, now it's getting very sophisticated with a lot more bronzes and beautiful woods added. He's, he starts as being an artist first, and he takes nature and sees what he can, in his head, what he finds in nature, and then he translates it into usable art, so mm -hmm. furnishings and things. So what type of space do you need to have that okay, so shiny? Good question, because he bought the biggest one I've ever made. Bigger today. than this? Oh, it was huge. It's like yeah. two parts. Yeah. It was giant. It's, it's so actually, what kind of space? Where is the house? <laughs> okay, so there's a, a new house that we're building in Sagaponic in the Hamptons. And it's a barn-style house, so it has very high ceilings. And it's basically a big open volume. So when you walk into the house, we have a more contained, smaller one. And then in the grand living space, living dining room, open area, there's a really large one that's going to be facing to the view. So, uh, have you ever been to homes where you see your work? Great question. Because I really I really like to understand the space that a piece is going in, um, especially if they're commissioned. Um, and I, I mean, I find it um, gratifying when I get to finally see the, 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 the piece in situ. But I don't always get to see you know, my work. But Finally. You, but when you see a work in yeah. space, what yeah. does it do to you? Well, I mean, I just I just created a book, and I like to think... Yeah, this is that, a new book. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Um, I just, and one of the reasons I made this is because we live in a rectilinear world of flat surfaces and uh, screens, and I like to think that my world brings um, how we evolved in, in our primordial mind, which is like round. We didn't, we didn't evolve with uh, flat uh, surfaces. We evolved with round surfaces. So I like to think that when the piece is in a space that um, it's, it's hopefully corresponding or with your primitive mind, uh -huh. you know, or evolutionary mind. And also with the outdoor, also with the outdoor? Yes, absolutely, it brings the outdoor in for sure. So and I like, the, time, I like the timelessness thing you mentioned, but that's a huge compliment, by the way, because I, I like the idea that it could be from the past or it could be from the future you know that 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 notion is a huge compliment you know tony when you go to your client and you say i want i want this in your house this is very futuristic mm -hmm. uh what are their but reactions i i start by saying this people <laughs> this is going to make you smile right and this is going to evoke an emotion that you're not going to get from buying something static yeah. so when you look at something that's going to... We all need to be put in good moods lately. The exactly. world is not a, a great place, but Ronan creates pieces that make you happy. So right. that's right. how I present. That's why his interiors are filled with art pieces, amazing art pieces. So thank you for the tour yeah, here. Of course. Thank you. of course. I'm Lee Mindell, an architect, fellow of the American Institute of Architects. This is John the Lion, and this is Yoko the Dove. So the names of these two pieces are John and Yoko. But don't think it's John Lennon. Yoko, yes, Yoko Ono. And it's about that scene in the bed with peace. And this is why it takes the form of a dove. But this one, John, is a different John. This John was the mentor of the artist. Do you want to say something about the artist? Well, Porky Heifer is... Uh one of the most sophisticated artists in the world, but he remains the most sophisticated child at the same time. So he celebrates all those things that we've maybe lost in our childhood and he's been able to create into art, uh, fantasy, uh, nursery rhymes, endangered species, and he teaches us to celebrate the child in all of us and what's really important. And he's, this, John was his mentor. And when he was very young, he didn't know what to do. He didn't have a direction. He was at the in the army, actually. And John, his mentor, told him, you have to go to art school. And he didn't even think that he, really, he belongs to art school, but he went. And now he wants to celebrate John. And by the way, he's, he hasn't seen John since. And he's hoping that with this story, he'll find John. Him. Is, he'll find John. So why did you choose those? Well, 
As another note, we have a gallery in New York called Gallery 56. And in the spring, Porky's going to have an exhibition with us, Talk to the Animals for Children. We're going to create a coloring book and we're going to have things for children to learn about endangered species from Africa. And the, the forever child in him resonated in the person I want to be, which is to never lose the joy of your childhood. I'm Karim Mahana. I'm the co-owner of the Le Breton Gallery based in Monaco in south of France. Uh, we would like to show today an exceptional piece by Suzanne Ramier, Studio Madura. To Le Breton, and you spoke in our uh, program about Suzanne Ramier. Of course, yeah, and the Studio Madura in Valoris. And Valoris. also decided to present this piece. I want, San Maria. I wanted to share with you this uh, exceptional sculpture vase she created in 1970. It's one of her latest work before she passed away in 1974. And in the late 60s, Suzanne Ramier wanted to uh, go in a different direction, more sculptural uh, ceramics. And that's what she did with a touch of, she kept her traditional work as well as a vase, but creating a kind of a diamond cut sculpture with the light works on it. It's, it's, if you go around and see but all the work. it's not typical because no. when we spoke, you mostly spoke about the birds. The 1950s. Uh, the 1950s, like this one. Yes, and this one there, all the yes. Tarasque and... This is gorgeous, this one. Nice and, one. But this one is not typical, so why did you decide to choose this one? Uh, for two reasons, for the aesthetic uh, look of the piece and the color this glazing her unique glazing and especially because it's one of her latest work so she was very uh, proud of preparing an exhibition that happened after her death uh, called the sculptures of Suzanne Ramier so and if you turn around this piece and you see in the light you see it completely different, in a different way. It depends how's the light on it. It's, uh... And you know something, Karim? I'm talking to a lot of interior designers and everyone is praising your gallery and what you do. And they all tell me that they love buying these pieces for interiors. So I see that these French ceramics Ceramic. of the 60s and 70s yes. is, has a moment right There's now. There's more and more uh, collectors as well, uh, contemporary art collectors. Uh, who wants to mix with the paintings, have a, a historical ceramic uh, work. So uh, it's the market is changing with the ceramics. It's more and more considered as an art, more than it's, uh, uh, how do you say? Like, uh, like yeah, functional. Functional. functional okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, can you just show one more piece by her? I would like to show you the Tarasque. So this is a work from 1949. And this is when she got her first electrical kill. Uh, she created this glazing, this satin white. The story about this piece, she made few of them for herself. Uh, once Picasso came to her studio and he saw it, he said, now it's mine. So she had to do it for Picasso. So this is one of the rare example where it's without the decoration of Picasso, without the design of Picasso. So, and then they made the additions so with the uh, form. The form, she made the form and then she gave it to Picasso. So he used the form for his painting on the ceramic. And this is very early before that happened, right? So she created in 1949 and she called it Tarasque. Tarasque, it comes from uh, the name of the city in, in Provence called Tarascon where there is a legend that a monster lives in a lake. So the design is a little bit a monster between a fish and a, and, and a bull. I'm Miriam Badaró from Mercado Moderno Gallery, and we'll talk about this chair by Joaquin Tenjero in original condition, with feet in rosewood and sweat. You selected this chair. Exactly. Why? It's produced by one of designers that we talked about. It is, he's the master in Brazilian modern design, the pioneer of all them. Joaquim Tenjero, the same designer as these pieces and as this tool. In his production, is a very rare piece. It's more robust than normally he used to produce, like this one. He was the first designer that produced a Brazilian modern in Brazil. Originally, he worked for a manufacturing company 
he didn't have um, uh, authority for making creative pieces, he had to follow a bit the European model. And then he opened his own company where he finally could produce his own design and he became the master in Brazilian modern furniture. This piece specifically was commissioned by a family, uh, the whole house, uh, so many pieces of furniture designed by him. It's absolutely different from his regular production. The, the feet are thicker than normal. Uh, the curves, you will see this boomerang shape also in Zanini production, very typical lines from the modern period but inside his production is a very rare one. We never found any other of this uh, in 20 years of the gallery. And, and you know something, I, when I look at this, it looks very much like, uh, like a genre. Yes, yes. But it's the same period, it's exactly. also very architectural, but this is very special. I've never seen anything like that. How many pieces like that have We you just seen? found one of these in 20 years, yes. Oh, and wow. Yes. And what is the wood? Rosewood. Because you spoke a lot about the materials and the wood in Brazilian design, yes, right? Yes, exactly. There is a richness of wood, a great quantity of wood in Brazil. Rosewood is the most noble one. Nowadays, it's not permitted working with this wood, but at that time, it was very common. It's the original feet in a very well-preserved condition with a real poster uh, preserving the most the aspects of the initial the original version of the the fabric so what if for example this one oh my goodness super heavy so solid heavy. wood wow. super heavy what this is, is a contemporary it? piece yeah. in caviuna oh. very very heavy what is this wood caviuna but can you see here like when you see it in person you can really understand when we speak about wood and this very special character of the Brazilian wood, which is different. It's, you don't find it anywhere else. You can see the, the grains of the wood. You can see here the rosewood is actually a bit lighter, but with the varnish it gets this very typical uh, dark color. These are a perfect example of rose, solid rosewood too, by the same designer. These pieces are historical pieces. You can see this in so many books by Joaquin Tenreiro too. And this is more typical in his production, a more light piece with the use of cane. The use of cane, for example, it was a way of doing lighter pieces than the European model that, uh, that have cushions, uh, heavy cushions. So he designed this. This is very typical from his production. This and this is more like a special one. My name is Rachel Delvia. I'm the curator of decorative arts and design at Carnegie Museum of Art. I am presenting on Jiha Moon's Mother Moon Jar. Why did you select this? I love Jiha's work because it's so much fun and she really brings a lot of energy. She brings color. I think she's so talented in how she's using, this is her work too, by the way. I think she's so talented in how she's using the object as canvas because she actually started out as a painter. She trained as a painter in South Korea and really didn't get into ceramics until about 10, 15 years ago. So this is a later development in her work, um, but it's just a wonderful mashup of forms and colors and ideas. This is like, Rachel, I want to ask what makes this piece contemporary mm -hmm. and museum quality? Okay, well, a, cu a couple of things. So. One of the things that Jiha is really known for is the way that she's bringing motifs from Asian culture, motifs from American culture, motifs from Mexican culture, all of these different cultural mashups. She calls herself a, um, a cartographer of cultures. And so this is very contemporary, right? We are living in this global world. We have images and motifs that are mixing on the internet. They're mixing in our lives. It's almost impossible to like extract one place from another anymore. And so I think that's, that's one of the things that makes her work really, really contemporary is all of these references. Because you know, one of the things in our series and also in this video is we want to learn how to look at objects and what makes them representing the zeitgeist. Yes, yes. So is this artist represented in your collection? Not yet. She is an ah. artist. I picked, I picked Jiha also because she's an artist I've been following. 
and um, somebody whose work I would really love to have in our collection. And so this became an opportunity to also do a little bit more of a deep dive on an artist who um, has really piqued my interest. I mean, more specifically with some of these motifs, and I think show us the back too. So. I think, I think what's so important about, you know, you're mentoring, kind of mentioning the zeitgeist of the moment. And so she has really tapped in to the history of ceramics. So this form comes from the Joseon dynasty in Korea. It's known as a moon jar, this white porcelain jar. You can find them in the Mets collection, museums all over the world. Of course, they don't have all of this um, effusive ornament. And so she's pulling something from her, her cultural past and then she's throwing in also these references to what it feels like to be an Asian American today, right? And so until very recently, she lived in Atlanta, Georgia, um, you know, a city with a rich history of civil rights and Martin Luther King, but also a city where there has been very prominent anti-Asian hate crime. And a lot of Koreans, by the way. Uh, Atlanta has a huge Asian population. They don't hear you because you don't. Oh, okay. Atlanta has a huge Asian population because Delta Airlines is a hub okay. to uh, South Korea. So, it's, so it's she's all, part of a diasporic community there. And so she has things from, from the history of Korea, but then she also has things like wontons, these things that are maybe even more of a part of an Americanized version of Asian culture. Yellow plays a big role in her, in her work. And she's referencing with the yellow and the banana racial slurs referring to Asians and Asian Americans. But she's also, um, she's subverting that and reclaiming that. Yeah. So I think it's really important your analysis because when we buy a piece of design into our home, we want to know how to look at it. Mm -hmm. We want to know how to analyze it because that really makes a huge difference. That really brings depth, brings yeah. more dimensions to the piece and therefore making us more enjoy, it makes it more enjoyable yeah, to absolutely. live with something that we understand this way. My name is Sebastian Bruipis. I'm an artist. I work for David Gill Gallery. This piece is called Canut. Welcome to Miami. And you have, you're showing, this is a brand new table. Yes, a table or a bench or both. So, bench? Oh. Yeah, you can sit on it. Okay. Wow, okay. Can you tell us about the language here? Because it's... Uh, very special and new to you. Yes, well, basically I do a lot of yoga and I, I, I see yoga positions. And I always said about my work, the way that the, the seat is made, is built out, it's, it's to hold the body. So it's actually a body. And so the yoga position is, is another expression of the body, basically. You know, and I'm a shirt. yoga practitioner. I didn't I, I you would, are. I would, I would, I, you can see it a little what bit, to be honest. What type of yoga do you practice? Uh, it's, it's just men's yoga. We are like a little group and we do actually a, a, a whole mix of yoga. You know, it's one of the things I always say to designers that what is comfortable? Like, what is a comfortable seat? For some people, a comfortable seat is something that you just lie down like that. Mm -hmm. For me, that's not a comfortable seat. For me, that's a decadent seat, actually. Right. So for me, I like to sit somewhere where I have, I'm forced to hold my body. Mm -hmm. Is this something you were thinking about? Yeah, and uh, you don't want to uh, expose everything that you have, all the energy that you that that you have in the in the creases of your body. So I think that's that's also something. So Sebastian, about. you are very known for a really expressing the most, the best of hand craftsmanship Thank in you. your pieces. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about how this was made? Yes. And this, if you could show us this piece how is, this is made. This piece is uh, for the first time that I work with, uh, with David Gill. I uh, asked David Gill, you are known for work with acrylic and stainless steel. And I would want to do something like that too. But here now, I would like to combine bronze and stainless steel. Oh, so this is stainless steel. This is stainless steel, and, this is and that is bronze. Yes. And I, um, for me, it was um, I wanted to express also a, a little touch of masculinity because I always saw show the femininity, which I have very strong in, in myself. And now, working with stainless steel, I hope that I can kind of 
you know, balance a little bit more towards uh, masculinity, so it's a whole for me. That's really interesting. So mo most of the pieces are very feminine. I mean, I can see that. Yes. But you feel that introducing stainless steel is, is masculine, is going to balance them? Yes. Yes. And can you say something about how did you arrive to this pattern? Yes, this pattern is for me uh, a river, and uh, this piece was the the first piece was actually a commission and uh, from a dear friend of mine, and he asked me to make something uh, that is flowing, uh, and so this is the river, and it flows around, and it goes around and around and around, and and actually the the idea of movement and flowing is also captured in the in the shape and as you know you we do yoga it is it is uh, the thought that you need to have in your positions of flowing and the river and, uh, and yeah. but how do you get how do you achieve this color in patina that's a very unusual color yes i i work extensively with uh, with our bronze foundry we have a very good one and uh Where is that? um uh, in the south of europe okay uh, and um, uh, yeah, we, we work for days on the right color. I, uh, so, did, is this your special color for you, or did they do? For now, it's going to be yes. This uh, I chose this light blue, and um, I'm going to stick with this color for a while. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking there is a very famous movie about Jean Prouvé's house in Africa, yes, which was, uh, it's, it's a movie that unfortunately you can see. I saw it in a special screening years ago. I've been mm -hmm. looking for it since. But it shows how the collectors removed those houses from Africa by Jean Prouvé. Mm -hmm. And those houses had the special doors mm -hmm. with blue glass. And the filmmaker uh, interviewed the guy who was uh, living there as a child, and he's telling how he was looking through the glass, the blue glass, oh, and wow. he was envisioning the water, which was so far from there. Mm. And he was envisioning, you know, the beach. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at this, mm -hmm. I envision the water, flowing water. That's what you want. And, and to be honest, the bronze foundry is very close to the beach. Thank you for attending our curated tour. I hope you enjoyed it. I wanted to tell you, first of all, I want to thank you for taking our program in Christie's, but also to tell you that our next season is devoted to interiors. Interiors of the past and interiors of the present. So while I'm going to host some of the top interior designers of the world, I'm also going to host scholars and curators and writers who are going to talk about the years of the past because you cannot understand the present without knowing the past. So thank you very much and welcome to Design Miami.